Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, today's video, I think, is just going to be a little bit more relaxed. Um, I'm just going to kind of talk to you guys about IBS because I think that it's such an important thing that needs to be out there because so many people suffer from it and like I think a lot of people kind of feel shame maybe towards IBS and I just don't like that as a way for people to live with IBS because it's out of their control, it's not their fault and I think there's a lot of stereotypes and kind of things that people assume that are true for everybody with IBS but it's such a personal thing like it's such it's so individual to every single person and I think it can be really hard for people to live down the negative implications that people sometimes feel around IBS and that's really rubbish because you might not even have those symptoms that you're feeling so shameful about so I'm just gonna sit down with my iced coffee oh it's all over the table this is why you should use coasters. I'm just gonna wipe it with my hand. You dirty pig, Alicia, you dirty pig. What? No, okay. Okay, so first off, I'm just gonna say I don't have IBS. I have systematic bloating, which is like a, a rare, very specific condition that doesn't technically come under the umbrella of IBS, but it pretty much has like all of its symptoms, so bloating especially being one that was really difficult for me really really hard to deal with and obviously you guys know like diagnosis takes such a long time you might be watching this video and you haven't been diagnosed with IBS or IBD or anything like that but you're aware that something's not right in your digestive system Ooh. but you can't get your doctors to listen to you or they can't figure out what's wrong with you because you keep coming back negative for certain tests so let's just have a discussion let's get some stuff out in the open and I'll throw in a little bit, few bits of advice. Um, I did do a tips and tricks video already, which I'm gonna link for you up there. Um, so jump on over to that. I'll also leave it on the end screen so you guys can watch it after. But this video, I want to be more about a discussion. I want it to be more about being open and just kind of raising awareness of how individual IBS can be for people. So I think one of the first things you have to kind of become aware of in terms of IBS is the fact that you probably know a lot of people that have IBS, but they might not talk about it. And if they don't have IBS, they probably get a lot of the symptoms. So bloating after eating, constipation, um, diarrhea, stomach cramps, headaches, heartburn, like weight gain. There's so many negative connotations and, and a lot of them are true. Uh, but I think, especially one of the ones that I struggled with, I keep knocking that, stay still. We're talking about IBS. I think one of the ones that I struggled with especially was that when people found out that I had IBS because I didn't go around saying systematic bloating because people didn't know what it was and I didn't want to stand there and talk them through about what happens in my digestive tract every time I eat so I just kind of said to them IBS because it was so much easier it was a blanket statement and everyone had kind of heard of it at this point so that's what I did I kind of talked about it that way and like this isn't an easy thing for me to sit down and talk about like my YouTube videos don't normally talk about these kind of things but at the same time if I don't step up to the plate and start talking about these things then how can I expect these negative connotations to go away and I think one of the things that people really need to do that they don't do is talk to work I think another thing that people don't quite get with IBS is that it can literally have you off work sick and when people find out that you're off work sick because of IBS I think they can kind of be like are you serious like what your stomach hurts you're not coming in like it's not okay but i know that my friend has had to call in sick before but because she hadn't spoken to work she didn't say that on the phone she said a different reason because trying to explain to somebody that you literally can't be more than five feet away from a toilet at this current moment in time that's not an easy thing to discuss over the phone especially if one of your peer colleagues picks up when you call in sick so I think even though it's a really hard discussion to have, you need to speak to your boss. You need to speak to somebody in charge and also maybe ask your boss to talk to people like shift managers so that people are aware. Because I remember I was on a shift and I had a piece of toast, which was a massive mistake. And I literally had to disappear for like 20 minutes just because my stomach was so bloated so fast and the cramps were so horrendous that I couldn't walk around and pretend that everything was fine. 
So I, you know, disappeared for 20 minutes. I said I was going to the bathroom, but I actually just went outside for some fresh air to try and sort this out. But obviously my superiors were like, well, you can't just disappear for 20 minutes on a shift. Like it's not your break. It's about talking to your superiors so they can justify why you're not there. Because with IBS as well, I think it can be very quick to onset. You're fine one minute and you are completely screwed the next. So people just need to kind of be aware that because you've disappeared for 20 minutes, you're not slacking, you're struggling with a condition. And I think other conditions, for example, like Crohn's disease, that's ex like extremely serious, extremely uncomfortable. And I would argue worse, much worse than IBS. Um, but if you went to an employer and said that you had Crohn's disease, you'd probably get quite a lot of sympathy. And if you went to an employer and said you have IBS, they'd be like, yeah, you and me both, everyone has IBS. But I think it's so important that you discuss the actual symptoms because they are different from person to person. And because they're different from person to person, they're gonna affect you differently. They're gonna affect your life differently. They're gonna affect certain relationships differently. So I just think it's an open discussion that we really need to have with people. And you need to have the confidence to go forward and speak to your employer about this. Because if you don't, then nothing's gonna change and you're gonna feel like people are watching you slack off at work when in actual fact you're dealing with a diagnosed condition and you know, you're not okay. So just don't be afraid to do that. Don't be afraid to kind of own up to the situation and, you know, speak to people. Don't be embarrassed. Just take a deep breath and do it. And if you want, you could always write a letter. If you don't want to have that face to face conversation, put it down, handwrite a letter, maybe give it to your employer and then kind of or converse over email, just something so that there is an open line of communication about the situation. So also kind of stressing the whole point where it's all about you. It's because everybody is individual. And I don't mean everybody is individual, like everybody is individual. And if you don't kind of appreciate that fact, then you're not going to understand what it is that makes you tick. So a lot of people say figure out your trigger foods and this is good advice, but equally I think it's more important to know your safe foods, something you know that doesn't make you bloat. Now my bloating is intrinsically linked with stress and I personally struggle to know my safe foods and my trigger foods, but I have a different friend from the one I said earlier and she knows exactly what foods she can eat and she won't bloat, she won't get heartburn, she's okay. And one of hers is toast. Now, when she said this to me, I was like, toast is like something I treat myself to when I know I'm not stressed, I know I'm not gonna bloat because I love the taste, I love the smell, but like, it's just, it's not good for me. And she was like, that's so weird. Like when I know I'm gonna bloat or I know I'm in a really bad situation, I know I can eat toast and I won't be in too much trouble. And I think this is so imperative to the understanding of IBS and how it works. It is individual to you. You have different microbiome in your stomach. You have different antibodies. You have different digestive tract mucuses. You have different muscles, different body types, different fat stores, different metabolisms, different sugar levels, different DNA. It's so important that you see yourself as you. If you Google what are safe foods for IBS, that's a good place to start, sure. But I personally don't think I have a single safe food on the list that comes up when you Google. So I just I don't really believe in it, but at the same time, give it a go. So for example, I know that one of my trigger foods is greens. So things like kale, broccoli, spinach. But weirdly enough, I've actually started to introduce spinach back into my diet and it seems to be going okay. But I think that's because I spent about a year rebuilding my gut microbiome by being really good to it and taking really good care of it. So now it's starting to deal with it. So it's a long journey. You're gonna have good days, bad days. You're gonna have good months and bad months and good years and bad years. I had two horrendous years followed by one amazing year followed by another two really bad years. And that's because also I think that the movement of time, your safe foods will stop being your safe foods and your triggers will stop being your triggers. So as you grow and you know, like no matter what age you are, you're always developing, your organs renew every seven years. So there's a constant cell turnover, there's a constant blood turnover, there's different changes in metabolism, the amount of muscle to fat ratio that you have. All of these things change every single day. 
And I think it's so important that you just keep checking in with yourself. You need to kind of have this awareness, this conversation with your body as to what it is that's actually working for you. Because one day you might wake up and your safe food might be the worst thing for your body. And that is just the way it is going to be. I am sorry to tell you, but you're just going to have to be aware that you're going to have to constantly change what works for you, learn what works for you, relearn what works for you. And it's exhausting. It is. But when you find those safe foods again, it is so rewarding and you're going to have so much better time eating out, having a good time, seeing your friends and, you know, not having your day ruined. So another thing that like I picked up on, I found that I drank tea quite a lot and that was fine. But when I drank coffee, coffee was slightly harsher on my stomach. And if it was my first cup of the day, then I was absolutely fine. However, when I'm studying and I have more and more caffeine, I found that it was really starting to affect my stomach. And to be honest, I don't know what it was in my body, my brain, my stomach, something told me it's not the coffee, it's the milk. And I didn't understand that. Because if I drank cold milk, I was fine. And if I drank hot milk in a coffee, I just felt bloated, I felt heavy, I felt bunged up, it was just not good. So then I moved to iced coffees, which are so easy to make. Just make your coffee, stick it in a mug, wait for it to cool, then you can pop it in the fridge and then maybe put some ice cubes and some milk in. And that for me just made a massive difference and I actually think it was to do with temperature. So nothing to do with a safe food or a safe liquid, it was more to do with the fact that I was putting so much heat into my digestive tract that it just couldn't cope. So something cold can sometimes soothe it. And again, this is something that will probably change over and over again, so you need to stay aware of it. But it's just an idea that sometimes it's not just the food, it's the texture of the food, or it's your feelings towards the food, or it's the temperature of the food. You know, there's so much you have to think about and there's so much you have to take into consideration in order to kind of live a life that's unaffected mostly by IBS. Kind of going back to talking to employers and different things at work, if you have a good boss, they might ask you, what can we do to make your work life more easy? So for example, me, I work on wards, I work in a hospital, I'm walking all the time. And that for me is great because being active helps keep my digestive tract moving. It helps keep me active. It helps me not be bloated. Um, as long as I stay hydrated, hydration is so vital. Um, but then if you think about other people who work at like desk jobs or if you work in a situation where you're sedentary for most of the day then when you stop moving your digestive tract pretty much stops moving and not only that but if you aren't using your extremities so if you're not using your arms and your legs your blood flow will pretty much focus on your digestive system and your organs in the center of your body that's why you get cold hands and feet when you don't move much now there's nothing wrong with that but that normally leads to hunger because the more blood flow around that area the more it like give me food and obviously when you eat especially for me that then leads to bloating which then kicks off this whole array of other events. So one of the things that I've actually learned that's really good for me and I couldn't run, I'm a terrible runner, I hate running. It's like the bane of my existence. And literally two weeks ago, my boyfriend was like, come on, we'll go for a run. I'm like, I cannot run, you're not listening to me. I'm terrible at running. And I was like, okay, fine, I'll, I, I will. And then we'll see how it goes. And when I, I was really hungry when I left my run, we were gonna have dinner when I came back. And I went, I only did three kilometers because that's all I could do with like a break every kilometer. And when I got back, I had no appetite. And I had a shower and I said to him, I was like, I just don't want dinner. Like I'm, I'm not hungry anymore. And he was like, oh yeah, that's because all of your blood flow has gone to your muscles. So your stomach's no longer wanting food. And I was like, what the hell? And then when the blood flow returned there, like two hours later, I felt really settled. So now what I do is I kind of like try and eat an early dinner on days that I run and then run around 7 p.m., not for long. And it just allows my digestive system a bit of a break from intense blood flow. And therefore it gives it a chance to just like chill out and stop being so inflamed and, you know, get back to wherever it needs to be. Also, be careful of straws. Straws can sometimes make you breathe in a lot more air. And I personally don't feel this, but a lot of people, a lot of the advice I got when I was diagnosed was that you need to be careful about eating food and talking because you're inhaling air into your stomach and you're kind of swallowing air. And because you have to suck up a straw of air before you get to fluid, 
that can cause people to bloat more. Now that's specific to a certain type of IBS and a certain type of different conditions. Um, I personally haven't experienced it, but if you're somebody who drinks out of a straw a lot, or somebody who talks a lot when they eat, maybe try eating by maybe try eating by yourself, um, just so that you're not speaking, or watch something while you're eating, and maybe cut out straws for a couple of weeks and see if that helps you. Um, I know that it doesn't affect me, but it, it might make a huge difference to your life. So give that one a go. I think as well, it's really important that you stay active. So there's a lot of talk about 10,000 steps a day. And for some people that's really doable. For some people it's like climbing Mount Everest because they've been at work all day. And then when they finally get home, they're so exhausted. The last thing we wanna do is walk 10,000 steps. And 10,000 steps isn't something you can do in an hour. It's a lot of walking. And so the only thing I can really suggest is forget the 10,000 steps, maybe try for seven, because you can do 7,000 steps in an hour, you can do it in less than an hour, and it's so much better to do 7,000 than 2,000 in a day, because when you move, you know, your digestive tract is gonna move, it's gonna help you digest things, and it's just gonna help you move, and that is so important. So the other thing in terms of being active that I would suggest is belly breathing which doesn't really involve much movement, but it involves kind of like a massage within the abdomen through breath, which is amazing and I love it and it changed my life. So belly breathing, I explained why it's so important in my yoga video, which I will link up there for you. And I gave you guys an example of how to do it in my yoga tutorial, which I will link up there for you. Um, but belly breathing is basically just the movement of your stomach out and in. When you inhale and your lungs inflate, you let your stomach expand all the way out. It's nodding, it's agreeing with me. And then when you exhale, you bring your tummy back in and you kind of tense your stomach muscles and just allow them to engage for a second. And you just do that for about four minutes. And I have found that that really helps with bloating sometimes, really helps with getting everything moving. I think the final point I just wanna talk about is fiber. So a lot of people say that fiber will trigger them. And the other half of people will probably say that fiber is the only thing that allows them to actually go to the bathroom. Now, that's great, but I think there's a big hole of information when it comes to fiber. Fiber is something you can find in cereals, it's something you can find in beans, in toast. There's loads of high fiber foods. Google the highest fiber foods and you'll find them very easily. Now, high fiber diets allows you to go to the bathroom with more ease. However, fiber is a very thirsty component. So if you're not drinking enough water, then it becomes so dense that it doesn't dissolve. And then that leads to constipation. If you're gonna increase your fiber intake, then you need to increase your water intake. Because if you're not hydrating that fiber, then you're not gonna pass it with ease and you're gonna have the polar opposite problem than before. But then the other half of people are gonna say to me that fiber actually really irritates them, it makes them more bloated. Now to you, I would suggest that you do your research into fiber because I thought that fiber was only in things really that were carbohydrate based, if I'm being honest. When I thought of fiber, they're the things that came into my head. And I actually found that the fiber content in some like vegetables and fruits and things like that is actually really high. But because on packaging, the serving sizes of things like, I don't know, baby carrots is such a small amount the fiber looks normal, but when you actually think about how many you're eating, the fiber content is huge. So the fiber content in carrots is massive as opposed to the fiber content in cucumber, for example. Now, I love carrots, they're my favorite vegetable. They're not green, so they're kind of a safe vegetable for me. But I did find that, for example, if I were to, I don't know, have some carrots and hummus, maybe it would bloat me. I thought it was the hummus, it's not. It's the fiber content that was in the carrots. So sometimes it's not the thing, it's not the innocent food that's the culprit of your bloating. I thought it was hummus because you know, that's kind of like, it's got a lot of fat in it. It's not necessarily really healthy. I'm like, well, it's not gonna be a naturally grown carrot, but fiber is a natural thing to grow. So just keep an eye on fiber, keep an eye on the content. And it's so important that you think about the actual grams that you're eating. Because if it says, I don't know, five grams of fiber, fine. But if it's a five grams of fiber per 10 gram serving, and then you eat 100 grams, that is so much, and that's gonna lead you to be constipated without a doubt. Whether you have IBS or not, that's gonna land you in trouble. So just keep an eye on your serving sizes. Not, I'm not saying don't eat as much, eat as much as you want, just be aware of how much fiber you're having. And kind of maybe for a couple of days, 
keep track of how many grams of fiber you're having and then how your symptoms are. So you can do that with a food diary, which I highly recommend for finding your safe foods and your trigger foods. But I suggest keeping a food diary for a week and then ditching it. Take that information and then leave it because it consumes your life. And I just think IBS is hard enough as it is at, like without having to document every single thing you eat and drink along with all of your symptoms and everything that happens to you every waking hour. So yeah, that would be my advice to you. That would be the conversation I wanna have with people, especially if you're newly diagnosed. And if anyone wants any advice on IBS or how I dealt with it or my journey or like what you're struggling with and to see if I can help in any way, then please jump on to Scribbles by Alicia on Instagram. I will message you back and see what I can do to help. If you're watching this video and you're thinking of a load of tips that I haven't mentioned, or like, as I said, this isn't a tips and tricks video. It's more just like an open conversation. If there's more information you want to give out to people watching this video, please drop them in the comment section below. Everyone here, we need to be like a community and work together and see what we can figure out from each other. And also just like a massive thank you for tuning in, sticking with this video. Don't be embarrassed. You have your own body, you're an individual and you need to work out what makes you tick, what makes your body happy and what makes your body sad. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe subscribe button and I will see you soon. Bye.